You got it right? Okay. Um, as promised you, Mike Kakok cruised into our studio today and um, always good to have him here because we'll be able to ask him a few questions that um, might be curveballs to others, but uh, he'll certainly give us a straight answer. And um, Mike, are you enjoying the Durban season? Very much, James, yeah. You're looking like you've settled in here. A man normally comes well down here, gets ahead in the manger, play a bit of golf. Well, just talk about the golf quickly, because I know that you're one of the preferred invitees to the Wild Coast, but I hear that you've been doing a bit of damage during the week. Um, you've taken a couple of um, elderly pensioners to the, to the task. <laughs> James, not easy. These boys are well handicapped down here. Old Shrewdies, sack Southwood, yeah. around uh, a, a, a country club, yeah. but... Um, Every now and then a blind fowl picks up a bit of corn and we're being okay. Okay, answer, answer truthfully. What did you shoot? When? <laughs> Which Against day? Against Saxon and Southwood on last Tuesday. 73, scored. <laughs> got chopped. 70, 73 over 7, enough said. I'm not going to go any further on the golf. Let's talk about racing. You've got a, a horses down here now. You've, uh, you've sort of played with, you've had a string here obviously for a long time, but you played with moving them back to Joburg and coming back here. Um, how are you playing it this year? Yeah, not, not easy, James, uh, to juggle it these days. Um, I was going to take a one back, uh, and I must be honest, the morning he was supposed to travel, I stood and I looked at the truck, I read about all the reports of all the craziness on the roads, people burning trucks, vandalising. And I just thought to myself, you know, what, what do we want to take a chance for? And just decided not to send him back, you know. We've, we've had four July winners out of Summerfelt. We've got Barry Hinn in Joburg, him here. So, so we, we, you know, we're spreading our risk a little, uh, should there be a problem. But I just didn't want to take the chance, take the, you know, the horses got back okay, thankfully. But they may not have, then what would have happened? Yeah, exactly. So um, I'm not going to put him at risk. He's, he's quite happy here. He's a... Uh, you know, he's a, a man of a horse. Um, he'll deal with whatever comes his way. But, um, yeah, it was just a last-minute thing. The tracks are good at Summerfelt. Uh, the weather's good. You know, and, and on tough top with of grooms too. Spreading strings, travelling cars backwards and forwards. Yeah. And on top of that, he also probably likes to settle into a place rather than do the travelling up and down and that. You know, all those things can maybe get to him because... He is slightly quirky, isn't he? Oh, you know, uh, funny enough, also one of the big factors was um, the fact that we can gallop here again, the July gallops. Mm. Um, I felt the source needed to see the track again. I thought he was very green when he won. He was, uh, he was all over the show from the time he left the gates. Not really concentrating, running in snatches. Pulled a little bit. Yeah, well, look, he's always yeah. that way. He's always a bit of a mouthy horse. I mean, the brother's a bit the same too, if you see Rainbow Bridge. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, we'll deal with that, but... I think more importantly, um, I, I want to bring him back here to Gallup, and the, obviously the July Gallops are, are the ideal scenario. Yeah. Okay, now you won with Bahrain yesterday, and he won, looked like pretty impressive. He's a nice horse, James. You know, he is, um, he's very well handicapped. He um, uh, fortunately hasn't had uh, the handicapper's grubby paws all over him yet, like a few others I see have. Yeah. Uh, I say that with respect, um, just jokingly. He, but he's... When he ran behind um, uh, Hawam and uh, uh, Yvette's horse, I can't think of the National, yeah, National Park, Park. I think it's, uh, he never really at his best at us. Mm. And um, going into the derby, I thought, I thought he would be an absolute certainty. And then we had a little bit of a, a niggle before the derby. Not too bad. Went a bit off behind. Um, anyway, we've dealt with that, and he's been very good since. And he, um, yesterday's win for me was super impressive, given the fact three, right at the top end of the weights, giving five, six kilos to old horses and going to fetch them, but they were not stopping. So, you know, I thought that was, I thought it was a very meritorious win. Um, the fact that he's, he's got room for the handicappers to give him two, three, four pounds, whatever they feel like giving him. He's actually still under sufferance, and in my opinion, still underrated. Yeah. Uh, so, take our chances. Well, He's got to be, you, what you say has got to be correct if you go and look at Socrat and see where he's rated and see where this is rated and yes. he beat Socrat at levels. He did. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's why I say I believe he's got, a, he's got a good few pound in hand. I mean, he's not a, he, he's a horse that should probably finish up at 117, 118 in his, in his career. Okay. The big question is who's going to ride them? Who's going to ride a Wong? 
Sure, I'll look, I'm, I'm fairly confident Anton's going to uh, uh, write him, you know, he's, uh, I don't know um, if he's put it out there yet, but, um, you know, he's coming and writing every, work every morning like <laughs> a man that is writing it, so <laughs> it looks like he'll write um, a, one. a one, but, you know, it's, uh, and who'll write maybe that? Anton should make an official statement yeah, one day. Exactly. Sooner rather than but he hasn't later. told me he's not riding it, so I'm taking that as a yes. <laughs> he hasn't told anyone he's not riding yeah, it. Well, you're right. Yeah, I and mean, then he's got four that he, he could be riding. He takes it. juggling to another level. Yeah. Like Lester Piggott in the old days. Yeah. I remember Lester Piggott with the Derby. No one knew until a week before the Derby what he was riding. You know, we'll just, I'll wait till the end and see which is the best. Yeah. Um, who's riding, going to ride Byron? Well, Byron, we never really sort of planned a jockey yet. Um, you know, uh, um, I mean, there's one or two in the pub. I'm, I'm thinking, you know, uh, but I believe uh, Muzi's was, was one I've offered the ride to, put yeah. it that way. Um, I think you'll suit Muzi. He wants a strong ride, this horse. Um, so we'll see what, what comes of that. But Muzi also might be juggling a couple of balls, you know. It's, <laughs> it's like a big circus out there. <laughs> Fascinating. Which one would you pick if I put the real question to you. Yeah, Which one tough, would you have a better? Tough, tough one, but, you know, I, I must be inclined to go for the horse that's better off at the weights. Yeah. I'd love to have had another run, under, you know, like Barahin gave me three runs going into the race. Yeah. I'd really, then, wouldn't even be a, a, a choice for a pick for me. Mm. But, um, you know, you'd, you'd the, the problem with the other horse is just so good, but he's just so also mentally immature. Um, this horse is probably, I know Anton said he was very uh, green and immature yesterday, but, he, he's, he's possibly mentally a little bit more stable than, than, than Awam is. But, uh, you know, to be getting, what's he get? 53, Awam's got 56, 56 and a half. It's a lot of weight. Three and a half. Uh, and, and, and off the top horses, the, I mean, uh, Rainbow Bridge and Do It Again are two very, very good horses. Uh, we're getting much better than our weight for age allowance as well. Puts him a make, makes him a big runner, Jones. Okay, just talking about other people's horses, I know that you're not particularly worried about them, but um, the two top weights? Yeah, I, I was particularly impressed with uh, Do It Again on Saturday. I thought um, coming off a rest, it'd be a bit rusty and what have you. Well, that was one of the more impressive wins I've seen from him, coming off, you know, off, off what's he, since the Met he hasn't run. Yeah. Um, and I know he, I mean, he's also got his quirks, as a lot of good horses do. He did a good job there, Justin. Um, that was a very, very impressive win. I just, they're just such good horses, these, those top two. Uh, you know, with a horse like Barry. And I know there's some fairly well handicapped older horses out there. But I just don't know if they're good enough, even getting weight, to beat these. These are real solid group one weight for age horses. Yeah. I know it's a, a handicap. I get all of the above. But we don't have the luxury in South Africa of having that many weight for age races or a spread of handicaps that we can duck and dive and choose. Yeah. I mean, ideally, Justin and I were chatting on Saturday. If it wasn't the July, really. I mean, would you run do it again and would you run a one? Probably not. No. There was a really good wait for H10 for long in the day. Wouldn't that be some race? Exactly. Uh, you know, or whatever. Um, but the July is South Africa's SA Open. Yeah. We all got to have a crack at it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and why not? Great for the public. I think, I think the racing public this year have been... Uh, are pretty spoiled and I've seen some really, really smart horses around, three-year-old, four-year-olds, and now you've got them all taking each other in one race, in some race. I, I think it's probably the best July field I've seen for a very, very long time. You know? It must rate right up there, James, uh, in just terms of average ratings. I know we've lumped six pounds onto the, onto the crop, but even if you took that off international ratings, this, horse, this race this year I think must rate quite well. Very exciting times. Um, let's just talk about your overseas operation because we know things are happening there. Um, firstly, the, the export protocols. Are, are they going to come into place? What's going to happen as far as they're concerned? James, there's a lot happening at the moment. We, we for the first time, are talking to the right people. We've got, uh, uh, DTI's got involved um, and we've been t talking to the right people in DTI. And the DTI, uh, uh, there's some, some, some lovely people there. Um, uh, Guerrero's come on board and he's introduced us to some people, a lady there called Mpum, Mpumi at DTI, uh, that have been fantastic. They've come racing, they've looked at racing, uh, not from the public protector's clouded view, mm. but from a very open-minded view. 
to see past all of the nonsense and to see what an economy racing is. I mean, she sat at the races one day, she said, it's quite unbelievable. She says, as I sit here, I see a man driving a tractor, I see people stomping divots, I see billboards, I see a gin tent down the bottom that, that uh, people are working in that came to. Uh, I came here in an Uber. Um, there's restaurants, there's waiters, there's chefs. And that's we race, don't understand that that's racing... That's race day experience. You know? That, it, that is you. only the race day experience. We're not talking about when we start at studs, the grooms, the food, the, even people that sell you your cell phone, the banks, uh, cars, petrol. I mean, all of this economy around racing. We're actually massive employers. And, you know, while everyone like, likes to have a pot shot at this game, but be quite careful because I think uh, uh, job security is at risk here. Yeah. You know, if this industry falters or, or, or fails, it's not just the grooms. That, and look, the poor grooms will be the biggest losers. Yes. But it's not just them or the trainers or the jockeys. You know, while you can have a dip at us and call us what you like. But this economy of racing is something that people don't really understand. And I'm not quite sure if we haven't done ourselves a disservice and not doing a real proper study on the economics surrounding this industry everything that surrounds the industry. So now the DTI, the right word, the, the long word for them is the Department of Trade and Industry. Yes. How would they be involved in helping us get exports sorted out? Well, that very thing in, in, in talking to the right people. We've got all the science right mm. through DEF and their cooperation. So now you've got to talk to the right people in the EU uh, to accept what you're doing and to open or, or to lift the suspension. Uh, you must remember, it's not, it's not a, that we're discussing a new protocol. It's just basically lifting a suspension, which, is, which we've been under for, what, I don't know, eight years we haven't been able to trade. And they have opened those doors by talking to the right people at the EU. There's, there's meetings going. I mean, I, I would think by September, the latest, we will know whether we're going to be opened with or without an audit, or if there is going to be an audit, when it is, and when we'll be able to trade. If we don't know by September... I think we're going to be in trouble. There's a lot of positive things happening. For the first time, I've actually got a little bit of, a little bit of hope. And, uh, it, it, you know, obviously it'll, it'll be big for our industry. I, I, th I think it's essential for our industry, to be honest with you. I think our breeders, unfortunately, are rocking and rolling. Um, this they're year, the start, what, aren't they? You know, they, they're the start. Well, that's they're where the, it starts, the correct. Backbone, you know? Yeah. And there's, there's just so many less horses being bred every year. Yeah. And these sales are just decimating the broodmare. Um, a band. Yeah. So, what, okay, let's look five years down the line because you one of those guys that are quite good at looking at these things. Let's say we get 21 days quarantine and we're out of this country. Um, Be what very happens exciting. in five years' time? How many horses are we going to have left to race here? Yeah, look, you, you, you say that, but I mean, we may become a little bit like New Zealand, I, I suspect. But our, our race is still pretty good here. Stakes are, relatively speaking, quite good in relation to the rest of the world. But I mean, if we could up the broodmare band, say by 1,000, and Coolmore decides to have a stud here, or Stallions down here, Dali decides, Shadwell decide, that changes the game massively. And it all depends on whether you can get them in and out here. I, I think days. that is the be all and end all of it all. Yeah. They want to know when they can have their Stallions back. Mm -hmm. We look at what Shuttling did to Australia. And we're going to be able to take a Hawam. 40 days in Cape Town, off he goes to Europe. He might spend 30 or 60 days there. And I can take him down to Australia and go and run in the Cox Plate. Yeah. That, for me, is where it's at. It'll if, still take that long, Mark. Right? You'd have to do 60 days residency in Europe. Is that so? That's if, we, that's if we don't have, by then, a negotiated protocol di directly with Australia. But can you race during that 60 days, or do they have yes. to be in quarantine? No, no, you, you can race. So you can you take can, There's a quarantine a... period, obviously, before yeah. you fly out, and yeah. a quarantine period. 21 days. But you'd be able to go there. You've got to have a minimum of 60 days of residence, yeah. including your quarantine That's... there. But I think our horses, I mean, I'd love to see a, a do it again in Awam and Rainbow Bridge in Australia. Yeah. Australian racing is just unbelievably strong. It's, it's, they, they're doing so many things right there. And, uh, you know, I, I'd certainly love to be a part of that. I'd love to see, I'd love to see my son a part of that one day. Mm. And do the reverse. But source horses out of South Africa and race them in Australia. We've been doing it the other way around at 10 to 1. Yeah. Well, the point is, is that as a result of all this, things have changed in Dubai. Tell us how things are changing. Yeah, look, I mean, there's no point me keeping blue stables or, or an international yard alive anymore. It's very costly. I've got millions of rands worth of infrastructure in terms of uh, not only salary, uh, staff, uh, 
uh, spas, treadmills, all that kind of thing. So I've, I've taken the view um, that it's, not, it's no point in me keeping it going. So I'd rather close it, um, access to Dubai through England, We've got a beautiful facility there that Mary and Jess own. Um, go into the international stables like we did from day one and, and race out of there. When you're finished, whip them from there to Australia, wherever you want to go, or back to England uh, with I a very mean, select it, bunch, you know. It's the saddest thing I've ever heard. You know how much fun we had at Blue Stables. <laughs> know, where are we going to bry now? <laughs> where are we going to bry? <laughs> yeah, it is actually. The, it's, it's, what do you uh, do with the chickens? Yeah, we'll find out for the chickens. Don't worry, the chickens always have someone to look after them. Yeah, you've got to find someone not to eat them. You know, those chickens are no, like humans. No, we wouldn't allow that. But, so this is a huge decision. What, you've been, 20 years you've been in Dubai, but I think that Blue Stables, how long have you been there, Blue Stables? So, well, two or three, we started off there, Blue Stables, probably four or five years post that. Yeah. So maybe two or eight, two or nine, somewhere around about there, yes. I think. Yeah, it's a long time, it's... it's it's been a home, away from home as well. Mm. Um, but, uh, you know, one of the big decisions also is, is, is having the right staff. Trevor Brown was the right man, mm. and, and Trevor also felt that he'd had enough of Dubai, which is understandable. He's been there for a long time. Yeah. His wife had worked there, Joe, for a long time. She's also had had enough. You know, she was resigning. So it was actually an easy decision at the end of the day. Uh, it was an economic easy decision to make. Well, it just shows you, you know, the world changes. And uh, you've been making exploratory moves to have a look at Australia? Will do, James. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I'm certainly um, really open-minded about it. I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to go and check out Australia, for sure, Yeah. Um, with a view. Um, I'm, I'm taking the view that we're going to open up. Yeah. So I don't want to be left with my finger in the proverbial what have you, when it has, does happen. <laughs> And, you know, make sure that we're ready for it. I think I see a huge opportunity for South African bloodstock market in Australia. There's been a huge opportunity for theirs, yeah, 10 to 1. Mm. Why is it not the other way around? Uh, and it would, be, it would be fantastic for, for us to, to participate in their, um, their, 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 their carnivals. I mean, it's just unbelievable. Well, the other thing is, is that they breed very good sprinters, and a lot yes. of them. And we certainly up with everyone in horses that go middle distance or over a bit of ground. I would think that our horses would be competitive, certainly with Australian horses. No doubt. And I think, you know, getting a bit of their blood, their blood here. I mean, we've seen a little bit now with Wiley Hall, the yeah. dude's choice blood. You'll see it a bit with Rafif and those. They, they work very well. Yeah. And uh, there's obviously a, a real good market for us to, in terms of value, to market our horses to Australia. I mean, why shouldn't we? And their horses are becoming very expensive for them to buy. So I'm, I'm pretty sure that there's a, there's a market out there that we can, we can go to to say, hang on a second, there's value in South Africa. But I need to tell my man when I can deliver the horse. That is the most important thing. Yeah. Right now, I can't give you a delivery date. Yeah. So therefore, we're almost hands off. The Hong Kong Jockey Club have been fantastic in the support they've shown for us. And with the view as well, they've taken the view that we are opening. If we don't, by next year's sales, we're in biggest trouble there. Yeah. There's, there's no international money there. Well, let's hope that whatever you say comes true, because that's what we're all in this business for, to see if we can expand our, our, our borders. And Mike, um, wonderful seeing you down here in Durban again for the season, and uh, we wish you the very best. I'm enjoying it. I must say I miss it. So glad to be here. Mike de Kock, wonderful to have him in the studio. And... Um, I'm sure you'll glean a little bit of what is going on on the racing front. It's um, always a revelation to be able to chat to someone like Mike. And as you can see, he's one of those guys that gets out there and thinks about what's happening. Uh, proactive rather than a reactive is what I'd like to say about him. Fantastic having him here. Until next week, you have a good one.